This video is part of the Louisiana Tech University's Nanotechnology Education Series on YouTube. The topic of this video is nanoscale improvements to photovoltaic technologies, or solar cells. Today, solar cells represent the most logical way to produce clean, renewable energy. Energy from the sun is the only truly renewable energy source, and solar cells are the most direct way of converting sunlight to electricity. Humans currently use about 14 terawatts of power. The energy from the sun that strikes the earth is roughly 120,000 terawatts. Even though we could never hope to convert all of that energy to electricity, practically we might be able to extract about 600 terawatts using solar cells, depending on how much of the earth's surface we were willing to cover. To harness enough power from the sun to meet all of our needs, Using devices of the efficiency that we can make today, we would need to cover about one-tenth of one percent of the Earth's surface with solar cells. Solar cells are currently the most direct way of converting sunlight to electricity, but they are not very efficient and are also quite expensive. The field of nanotechnology, the science and engineering of the very small, offers promising ways to improve the cost and efficiency of solar cells perhaps making them cheap enough to meet the world's energy needs effectively in the future. To understand how nanotechnology can improve solar cells, you first need to know a little bit about how solar cells work. Most of the operating principles of solar cells come directly from the weird world of quantum mechanics, which describes the behavior of the world at very small scales, the scale of atoms and electrons. This can make solar cells seem intimidating to understand, but it's also a good example of how scientific theories that don't seem to make sense can actually tell us very important things about the world around us. Solar cells are made of semiconductors, usually silicon. Semiconductors are a category of materials that can be electrically on or off. When their electrons are at low energy states, they are confined to individual atoms and cannot move through the material. This means that they act like electrical insulators. This energy level is called the valence band. But with the addition of a little bit more energy, some of their electrons can become excited to a higher energy band, called the conduction band, and move freely through the material. In this state, they act like electrical conductors. The amount of energy it takes to move an electron from the valence band to the conduction band is called the band gap. Semiconductors can be doped, which means to have atoms of other elements added to them, to change their electrical properties. They can be doped to be electron-rich, called n-type, for negative, or electron-poor, called p-type, for positive. In a p-type semiconductor, the sites that are missing electrons are known as holes, and can be treated as particles themselves, even though they're actually the absence of a particle. A solar cell is made of a junction between n-type and p-type semiconductors. In a p-injunction, electrons from the n-type region move toward the p-type region to fill the holes. They create an electrically neutral region in the middle called the depletion region. Light, and all electromagnetic radiation, including x-rays and microwaves, travels in the form of photons, which are particles that act like waves or waves that act like particles. Same thing. The amount of energy that each photon carries is determined by the wavelength of the light, which we perceive as color. Red light has the longest wavelength and lowest energy, and violet light has the shortest wavelength and highest energy. When a photon strikes a semiconductor atom, it transfers its energy to an electron. If the photon has enough energy, it will excite the electron from the valence band to the conduction band. In this animation, the orange sphere is one silicon atom in a crystal. The gray dots around it are electrons in the valence band. When the photon strikes the atom, one of the electrons gains more energy, moves farther away from the atom. The atom is not isolated, however. It is surrounded on all sides by more atoms just like it. It's sharing its electrons with all of its neighbors. When an electron gets excited, it's free to move around to any of the other atoms. Because the p-type region is positively charged, it will attract the excited electron, which will move into the p-region. The hole it left behind will be attracted into the n-type region. By attaching an external load, like a light bulb, to the p-injunction, the electrons can be channeled into the circuit and used to power the load. Organic polymers represent an alternative to inorganic semiconductors. Polymers are long chains assembled from single molecules, and the polymers we are most familiar with are plastics. 
Organic semiconductor materials are made up of conjugated polymers that exhibit the same on and off behavior as we described. Normally, electrons fill the lowest energy levels, the highest of which is called the highest occupied molecular orbital, or HOMO. This can be compared to the valence band. When an electron gains energy, it is excited to the equivalent of the conduction band, called the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, or LUMO. Also, these materials can be doped to become electron-rich, called a donor, and electron-poor, called an acceptor, each with their own specific electrical energies and characteristics. The operating physics of organic solar cells are similar to those of conventional solar cells. A photon is absorbed in the polymer, and its energy is transferred to electrons and the HOMO of the donor polymer. This electron moves to the LUMO and leaves behind a hole in the HOMO. At the interface between donor and acceptor polymers, the electron and hole become separated. The electron is directed by energy differences within the structure from the LUMO of the donor to the LUMO of the acceptor. The same process occurs for the hole in the opposite direction along the HOMO levels. From this point, the operation of the two types of solar cells is equivalent. Generally, an organic solar cell is made from glass coated with indium-10 oxide, a transparent conductive material, upon which the polymer is deposited by spin casting. A metal, normally aluminum, is deposited on top of the polymer. Both the indium-10 oxide and aluminum act as electrodes, and the polymer as the photoactive region. Each of these components can be deposited in layers less than 100 nanometers thick. The use of polymers will allow for the creation of light, flexible, transparent, and perhaps disposable solar cells. The cost of fabrication will also be reduced because of the use of solution-based processing. Finally, the prospect of roll-to-roll -roll printing provides the means for mass production. This, along with improving the efficiency of the materials, could be the deciding factor in the overall commercialization of organic solar cells. The energy bands of semiconductors are actually made up of countless energy states all piled on top of each other. Each atom in a material can have electrons at specific energy levels. But the Pauli exclusion principle of quantum mechanics tells us that two electrons can't occupy the same energy level. When the atoms get close enough together to form a solid, their electron energy levels have to shift around a little bit so that they don't overlap. When you have millions of atoms together, the spreading effect is so pronounced that instead of individual energy levels, the electrons can occupy entire energy bands. But if you only have a few thousand or even a few hundred atoms, the energy levels don't have to spread out as much. Instead of energy bands, the electrons now only occupy specific levels called subbands. This property is called quantum confinement. Materials that are small enough to exhibit quantum confinement are called quantum dots because their behavior can only be described by laws of quantum mechanics. They are usually about 2 nanometers in diameter. The most important electronic properties of materials for solar cells come from the band gap. In quantum dots, the band gap is higher than it would be in a large amount of the same material, and the band gap can be controlled by changing the size of the particle because changing the number of atoms changes how much the electron states have to spread out. Quantum dots absorb light like regular semiconductors as photons excite electrons to higher energy states. But when the electrons relax very quickly and predictably because they have nowhere to go. When they return to their relaxed state, they emit a photon with the amount of energy that is equal to their energy band gap. We can perceive this in the particles glowing a specific color when lit by ultraviolet light. To use quantum dots in solar cells, we want to capture the excited electrons before they can recombine and emit a photon. Then we can use electrons to do the work. The reason we want to use quantum dots is to sensitize the solar cell to a specific wavelength of light. If we can attach quantum dots to larger semiconductor structures, we can transmit the excited electrons from the quantum dots into the bulk semiconductor. Then the device will be absorbing wavelengths of light corresponding to both the bulk semiconductor and the quantum dots. Scientists hope that in the future quantum dots will be able to improve the efficiency of solar cells. If they can, they will be very useful because quantum dots can be surprisingly easy to make, 
Just mix the right chemicals together in a beaker, add heat, and you have quantum dots. With ever-increasing worldwide energy demands and diminishing oil, natural gas, and coal reserves, the necessity of a clean, renewable energy source is greater now than ever. Solar cells offer the most environmentally friendly and the most abundant source of energy possible. To harness this energy in a cost-effective way will require improvements only achievable by the development of new novel technologies such as organic solar cells and quantum dots.